Thank you for inviting me to this event. Um, and thank you, Kuchel, for being my teacher. Um, the things that I will tell you in the next 18 minutes, I've learned here. And um, it was a very steep learning curve. So um, please bear with me. This is going to be quite a, quite a ride, I think. Let's, let's see what happens. Um, unfortunately, I have to go a little bit dark on you first. Um, I watch a lot of science fiction movies. It's something that I enjoy doing. It's a genre that I enjoy very much. And I don't know about you, but I have not seen a single science fiction movie, not one in my life, where the scenario is a positive one. <laughs> Yet at the same time, all of us can't wait to get into the future. All of you know what the weather is like tomorrow. That's a strange state of being. Now, let's go a little bit further. Um, I believe having a dystopic, not utopian, negative view of the future means that you live in an unsustainable way. The only way you can be pessimistic about the future is if you're living unsustainably. My name is Michael Loibe. Um, I'm an anthropologist by training, cultural and biological anthropologist. More than anything else, I'm an evolutionist. Um, in 2013, my life changed radically when I was invited to become a full teacher of anthropology and the social sciences here in Kuchel. <clears throat> and I'm forever grateful for that. There were some things when I first came here that made me scratch my head. Uh, there were some things I couldn't understand. I was uh, aware of the dire situation we're in. I was aware that you can't have infinite economic growth on a finite planet. I was aware of that. But unfortunately, I lost my idealism and became more of a realist because I started to see some of the tricks that are used for that situation. Um, my students were working on some... On some projects, um, and one of them is not this exact one, but one project that I would like to sort of talk about for a second, is a smart drinking bottle. Now, this is a device, a three-dimensional drinking bottle, and it has an integrated application, an app. And it has a sort of a form of, of artificial intelligence, I guess. Um, it tells you when you should drink, how much you should drink when you last drank something, and how much you should drink more. If, if, I'm, if I'm drinking from a water bottle, I put in the freaking water. <laughs> so if little Siri in the bottle, little genie in the bottle tells me, congratulations, you've just had 200 milligrams of water. No kidding, Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I have an app. I have an app. It's called Thirst. It is a fantastic app. It went through about five million, no, seven million years of rapid prototyping. <laughs> because nature is the mother of prototyping. <clears throat> it went through rigorous UX, user experience, and usability re uh, research. It was a matter of life and death, because my ancestors, the ones that had downloaded this before birth, for free, open source, they had children. Do I need to say anything else? So no, 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 I know exactly when I'm thirsty. So what happened to me in the beginning was, I, I was kind of lost, I, I wasn't sure where my anthropology fits in, so I went back to classic anthropology. I talked about evolutionary theory a lot. I was teaching and lecturing a lot. Cultural anthropology, biological anthropology. And perhaps the most important thing that I was able to tell, to convey to my students, was this little <laughs> formula. 99% of our genetic makeup are the same as a chimpanzee. One 
get to love your inner ape. Don't, don't, don't laugh here. It's a very spiritual and beautiful thing to accept you as an animal. Um, the other 1% is our sociability. We've reached the highest level of cooperation on this planet, along with a few other social insects, a few mammals, but not really very many. We are the descendants of winning groups, not winning individuals. Individuals don't have babies. Okay, so we are the result. Everyone in here should be grateful for a second. We are the descendants of winning groups that have left in the last wave of mass emigration Africa about 40 to 45,000 years ago in an act of incredible cooperation. So as I was going deeper and deeper into, into my anthropological um, theory, students would say, that's nice, it's interesting. They would enjoy it, uh, me talking about this stuff. But then they would lower their heads, they would get kind of depressed, and they would say, but we can't change humans. Really? Uh, I, can you say that again? We can change humans really quickly. We can change humans in 10 years when Steve Jobs unleashed the epidemic of the 21st century <laughs> onto us humanity. Can we change humans? Are you really, student, are you really accusing me of genetic determinism? We can't change humans. You want to see how we can change humans? We can change, design is the most powerful apparatus next to, next to nature to change humans. And you're dropping your head? Just this little piece of felt here is changing my behavior like crazy. <laughs> you take this away and I turn into Mick Jagger. <laughs> this is cramping my style right here. This, this thing is behavior change. I mean, of course you can change human behavior. That's the feature of design. And so I, I would have to be careful not to get cynical, right? <clears throat> My wife told me this morning. Um, <laughs> she, did, she did. I swear to God. She said, use some positive um, examples. And I said, I will. Um, when I was very low, I know this sounds kind of pathetic, but kind of lost up here in, in, in Kuchel. I mean, I loved working here. Don't, please don't misunderstand me. But, but I was confused. And I literally, thank you, Mr. Banksy, Mr. Anonymous Banksy, gave me so much mileage, this picture. Um, I literally ordered this picture in, in eBay and hung it up in the stairwell. This picture explains absolutely everything. On the right side, you have humans that have not developed very much at all in, in the last 40,000 years. Since the Paleolithic, our phenotype, our body, has not changed much. And this includes the way we look, the way we dress, the way we speak, the way we behave. That hasn't changed very much. What changes extremely fast is on the other side, and that is called cultural evolution. It goes extremely fast. Every couple of weeks, a new cell phone drops on us. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, so um, that's called cultural evolution, and it's due to design. Design is Prometheus. Design is the culture maker, and this was the most beautiful thing that could happen to me. All of a sudden, instead of just classifying and talking about humans from the outside, all of a sudden I was in the kitchen of culture. I was in the workshop, quite literally, of culture. And some of it is fantastic, some of it is not so great. Everything around us, without an exception, was made by the makers of the past. Designers, architects, engineers of the past. This is a beautiful example of what can happen. Everything in the future, the future is literally made by designers. So if students think I'm trying to make them, persuade them to change majors, they're so wrong, we need designers more than ever. There are some things that I need to talk to you about Designers, uh, sorry, about human beings. There's also some stuff about designers. But um, 
some things about the human being. We are novelty seekers. This is one of these anthropological constants. We are novelty seekers. We love variety. We like new things. We have a bad case of neophilia. And this is why we overeat in a buffet situation. And this is why this army of marketeers and advertisers can sell us just about anything. The other thing that's very important, out of many constants, but one thing that is very important, is that we're very aware and concerned about our hierarchy in a group. We need to know which group we fit into, how long we can stay in that group, and what hierarchy, what level of the group do we um, find ourselves in. Because, guess what, our ancestors, the ones that were kicked out of a group, ostracized, their genetic information is not with us. So, put those two things together, and we have what is called mass or runaway consumerism. And this situation that we're in right now, called runaway consumerism, is based on a kind of a myth, a kind of a delusion. I'll go that far. That I can sum up for you in three points right now. This delusion of runaway consumerism is based on one. Lasting happiness. That consumption of stuff gives you happiness. If that was true, if it was really lasting, you wouldn't purchase the next thing. Check. Um, the second delusion that we run into is that lower than average personality traits, us feeling inadequate, can be compensated by above average products. Gadgets, phones, clothing. It's called coolness factor. And the third, is that it's more efficient way to use, it's a more efficient way to use gadgets, products, and applications to show our personality traits than simply talking to people, shaking their hands, looking in their eyes, and hugging them. It's a huge delusion <clears throat> that we are living in. What we're really living in is what is called the laissez-faire. This is a French word for let it go, let it flow, let it be. And this picture here would be the metaphor of Adam Smith's invisible hand. Now, even though it seems unregulated, even though it seems like there's a free market system around us, I want you to think about that hard right now. Is it really that free, or is noble behavior, as in sustainable, ethical behavior, is that not, evolutionarily speaking, a fragile, vulnerable trait? Is it not actually default right now to live unethical, unsustainable? Do you not have to go out of the way to be a sustainable citizen? So in evolutionary theory, this is a fragile strategy that needs to be protected. How is the opposite protected? How is overconsumption protected, rigged, won? We pay very little taxes for consumption, value-added tax. And we pay a whole bunch of taxes for what we put into the system, income, encouraging us to slack off. Two, we have no idea where externalities are. We have no idea, and we don't want to know because we want to sleep at night. What went into this gadget? What kind of working conditions went into this gadget, into making this gadget? And how much CO2 was burnt in the production, in the use, and in the disposal of that? No, that's just hidden from us. And then there's a gigantic army, once again, of marketeers and advertising agencies that get the highest degree known to human society, PhDs, in putting carrots in front of us to constantly consume more, 
constantly making us feel, that's my carrot, constantly <laughs> making, making us feel like we're inadequate. And you're telling me it's a free market system? Um, the accumulation of all of everything that I've said so far is called garbage. We are the only species on this planet, without an exception, that has invented, designed this concept of taking resources out of the ground, molding them into shapes and forms and giving them functions that are not reverse engineerable, i.e. recyclable. That's called garbage. Only species on this planet. Now, that's the good news, because it's culture. It's not in our genes. It's culture, and that can be changed. My personal belief is that the only viable system, the only thing that works for this species, Homo sapiens sapiens, is the circular economy. So just like on this beautiful fall day, this is where it gets a little bit silly, there's a tree. I'm a tree now. There's a tree. <laughs> and it shakes all of its leaves away because it's so 2019. <laughs> and it waits for the new collection to drop in six months. <laughs> Can I get myself some new leaves in 2020? Every single year, total waste. It's not a problem because obviously it stays in a flow of resources. Now, obviously, to me, quite obviously, not easily, but obviously, we need to do something similar. Is it taunting? No, every single species on this planet except us does it. I mean, this is a statistical significant fact. Uh, <laughs> so, yes, 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 I am talking about regulation. And now, before you get weird on me, before we go into this old left and right discussion, which you're not going to change. You're evolutionarily selected to be left or right. And every time you're having a discussion, you just want to be the loudest. You're not going to change. So please think of this, of regulation, think of it in terms of biological regulation. There's no system on this planet that doesn't have regulation. Okay, self-interested, unregulated cells. Do you know what that's called? Cancer. That's not funny. Self-regulated individuals on the next level out, because I'm a group of, of, of uh, microorganisms and organs, lead to environmental catastrophe. Yes, that's similar to cancer. So obviously we need some regulation. I've got a freaking thermoregulator in here, so I don't heat up in this stressful situation. So my, my idea is very easy. We do something like in the pharma industry, does all along, and that is to check the stuff that hits the market very thoroughly. And we implement the circular economy. By law, that is the rubber stamp that you get. And obviously, the designer will implement those rules before they start development. <clears throat> Think back of that first picture that I had. I had this spaceship annihilating um, Earth. And that's what we pump into our brains every day. Think for a second that a spaceship comes down and sees the human race. Lands down and says, I'm going to give these people some advice because they need it. And if you put it into one sentence, I think that piece of advice as they spray paint, the alien guy spray paints over this Banksy graffiti, I think it would be give them confidence, don't keep giving them candy. Thank you very much. <clears throat>